The books of Ezra and Nehemiah belong together. And they're called books of the prophets, but they're not terribly prophetic. Mostly what they're concerned about is the end of the exile in Babylon. The Persians, Artaxerxes is the king, and he has said to the people of Israel, you can go home. Now, he didn't say you could have your own king. Artaxerxes wasn't an idiot. So he sent people along to make sure that they did what they were supposed to do, and a couple of those people were named Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and a lot of the book of Ezra and part of the book of Nehemiah is concerned with getting back into Jerusalem and getting things back to normal, something we hear a lot about today. The first thing they did was build the wall all the way around the city, keep everybody else out. The second thing they did was build the temple. The third thing they did was to look around and say, oh my goodness, during the exile, a lot of you people married people who are not Jewish. That can't be. We must remain clean and pure. And so you have to give up your wives and your children who are not Jewish, who become, belong to the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and any other ites you can think of. They gotta go. See that wall? Out there, people. In the midst of all of this, the people, notice the people, as we read today, all the people of Israel demanded that they be read the law. And so the congregation, the community was gathered, and this is very specific, and it's important to hear because it's said twice. Things that are repeated in the Old Testament mean you have to really perk up your ears. All the people, all the men, all the women, and all who could understand, which means anybody who was not a babe in arms, and it means anybody regardless of their nationality. There were still a few that hadn't left yet. And they gathered in the square around the, the water gate, which was the entrance into the city. And Ezra, the scribe, the priest, stood before them and for six hours he read the Torah. Now we have no idea how much of the Torah there was, but there were six hours worth and that's a lot of words. In the congregation gathered in the, in the square were, were uh, Levites and a few other scribes who were there to help the people understand what they were hearing. Now that's important. Nobody said, we're just going to lay this on you and then you go home and think about it. They said, we're going to read this out and we want you to hear how it is interpreted in life today. It's not enough to hear. You have to learn as well. And the people bowed down their heads before the Lord. And when the word began to be read, they stood up. Have you done that recently? Like three minutes ago? And when Ezra said prayers, they raised their hands and said, Amen, Amen, or Amen, Amen. It doesn't really matter. They said it. So be it. Yes, Lord, we understand. And when it was done, all of the reading, the people were weeping because when they heard the law, they heard how sinful they had been. It is hard for us to hear our sins proclaimed out loud. It's hard for us to think about them ourselves sometimes, and often they cause us to weep. But Ezra and the others say, you don't need to weep. This is a day of the joy. This is a day of the Lord. For your sins have been forgiven, and we are not here to weep. 
We are here to feast. The finest of the fats, the best wine. And when we are eating those, we are to make sure everybody else, everywhere else has them too. And the people rejoice. And that is the day that we celebrate every week. And we're not alone on that. Israelites do too, the Hebrews, the Jews of today, gather together once a week and they hear the word and it is explained to them or at least interpreted for them. I hope I'm not explaining it to you. And then they feast. And when we feast, we make sure others are fed as well. Yesterday is a good example of that. The times on Wednesdays when people come and get food so that they can feast themselves. Those Thursdays when we do the, the meal for the homeless shelter. Those are times when we share our feast with everybody else. Now, why on earth would I choose to preach on Nehemiah? Well, first of all, it's probably because it's the only time you're gonna hear it in three years of electionary. I don't think Nehemiah shows up anywhere else. It's part of our story. It's, it does help to explain what we do here. And not just here, but out there. And not just out there doing things for other people, but out there studying the scripture together gathering in a group and allowing the Holy Spirit to help us understand what we are hearing. There's a wonderful series of books, you can get them still, I have them on my Kindle because I gave my set away. It's called The Gospel in Salentiname. Salentiname is an island in Nicaragua and for several years, I'm sure he was a Catholic priest, would get in his canoe and he would row out to the island every weekend and he would worship with the people. And they would read a portion of scripture and the books, the gospel and Salataname are not what he said to the people. It's what the people said to him. As they read the scripture and they heard it in their own place, in their own situation, and they heard God speaking to them exactly as they were which was in the middle of a revolution. I can't, was it Ortega? I think it was Ortega, was you know, trying to take over the country. Things were not good. People were being killed right, left, and sideways. All you had to do was wake up. Sometimes you didn't have to do that. They would just kill you. It was a terrible time. And yet these people gathered every week and they read the scriptures and they said, Here what I, here's what I'm hearing the, the gospel say to me. Here's what I'm hearing the Spirit say to me this day, in this place and time, with what's going on all around us. That's what we're supposed to do. Ezra and Nehemiah say to me that we can be really good about building our walls, making sure our temples are nice and pretty, stained glass windows if possible, but not necessary lovely things in our presence, flowers, candles, altars, the whole nine yards. But if we don't sit down and study the scripture, it's kind of a waste of time, isn't it? A waste of good bricks. Because then all we have done is to create a space where we can shelter and let nobody else in. And we have no idea why we would do that. Because we haven't bothered to read what the Lord has told us to read. We haven't bothered to read our story. This is not the first time that, that the Israelites have built walls. There are other stories about walls. Sometimes they, they hold up and most of the time they don't. Remember Joshua and the walls of Jericho, which came down for the Israelites. And for a long time, the Israelites didn't build walls, but Jerusalem, they felt, always needed a wall. Why is that? Why do we build walls? Why do we insist upon keeping some people out and some people in? It's a human construct. It does not come from the Lord. Jesus never, ever kept anybody out. Even that poor woman who came to him and begged for healing for her daughter, and he said, I don't know what your problem is. I came for the Jews. 
And she said, no, you didn't. He said, oh, you're right. And her daughter was healed. We have to make sure that we don't build walls unless they're absolutely necessary. And when they are, we'd better make sure they're porous, that there's room for air and ideas and love to pass through that wall and maybe bring others into our space because they need a little bit of a wall too. Our wall is Christ Jesus. Jesus is the one who help, holds us up, who takes care of us, who sees us through, who walks through the valley of the shadow of death with us, doesn't take it away, doesn't say, oh, nothing will happen to you now, life will be wonderful. Jesus is the wall that helps us to breathe, helps us to open our space to others, to make sure that that wall can expand, that it can keep getting bigger and bigger, and that it is always focused on the one who gave us the word, the one who gave us creation. Wonderful psalm this morning. I hope you take that one home and say it a lot. I love that psalm. This is what we're about. Not building structures that cannot be breached, that keep everybody else who's not just like us out. Paul says this morning that we are a body. I love that passage. I'm pretty sure I've heard Michael Curry preach on that passage at least once, maybe more than that, and I'm thinking it was the first sermon he gave after he became presiding bishop. At the, the election and general convention, he preached about being one body. That the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. That we need all of the parts of the body and the tiniest pieces, maybe the most important ones, the things that we just don't pay attention to. And I have no idea what those are. We're not going to analyze the anatomy of the body and say, oh, that was, that was really little. Maybe that's important. That's what we have, is one body. And it doesn't have a wall. It has love, it has arms to reach out, it has voices to speak the word, it has ears to hear the word, it has minds to figure out what on earth that word is saying to me today. It has to be a whole. It has to all be there. It has to all work in this way so that the body can move forward. So that the body can impart to others their body. We're going to talk about the gospel next week because in their, in their infinite wisdom, the people who put the lecture together split the story in two. I hate it when they do that. But know that what Jesus was doing in the story is exactly what started in Nehemiah. He went to be where the people were gathered, he read the scripture, and then he sat down to interpret it for them. And we'll hear more about that next week. So brothers and sisters, I don't encourage you to read Ezra and Nehemiah. They're really kind of dreary books and they're very much walled up. But hear this portion that we have today. Hear what it means to gather together and not just hear the word, but to say to each other, well, what, what did you hear there? How did, that, how did that resonate with your own heart and your own life today? How did it touch you? Then we are being the people that we are called to be, that we have been called to be since long before this, this day in the square in Nehemiah. From the very beginning, when the stories were told orally and people sat there and said, oh, what on earth does that mean? And somebody said, well, I heard this. Oh, okay, I can, I can go with that. But what about this? Scripture is vibrant. Scripture has a heart and it beats and it moves and it doesn't always land in the same place. Keep reading it. 
Keep talking about it. Study it together. Wonderful Bible study on Sunday afternoons. Be there with each other, whether it's in person or whether it's on Zoom. Love that word so that the Spirit can help you open it up and make it real. Amen.